This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Oh, what a difference a tweet makes. Stocks spike after President Trump hints at progress in U.S.-China trade talks. Apple in focus. The most valuable U.S. publicly traded company is making more money from its iPhones and app stores than ever before. But investors were left wanting more. Hot sellers, why Americans remain head over heels in love with big cars, even as they get more expensive. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report. It's Thursday, November 1st. And good evening, everyone, and welcome. Not a bad start to November. Stocks extended their rally after the president tweeted that he had a productive talk with China's president on trade issues. The market rose for the third straight day, bringing the three-day gain in the Dow to 900 points. The blue chip index advanced 264 points to 25,380. The Nasdaq was up 128. The S&P 500 added 28. And as we start the month of November, here are some things to keep in mind. November is the second best month of the year for the market, up 1.5% on average since 1950. The six-month stretch from November to April is considered the best six-month period of the year. And since World War II, the fourth quarter in election years tends to rise. Now to Apple's quarterly results, which are being closely scrutinized given the pullback in the tech sector last month. First, the good news. The company reported record revenue and profit, higher iPhone prices, and strong App Store sales that all helped make the most recent quarter its best ever. But now the bad. Apple actually missed on its iPhone unit sales estimates and issued weaker-than-expected guidance for the holiday quarter. The company earned $2.91. That was 13 cents above expectations. Revenue was up by 19 percent from a year ago to $63 billion almost. The focus, though, was on those iPhone sales, which sent the stock down in initial after hours trading this evening. Josh Lipton is at Apple headquarters in Cupertino, California, with more. Apple sells a lot of products, but it's chiefly still known as the iPhone maker. In this quarter, the iPhone shipments came in at 46.9 million. The street had been looking for 47.5 million, so did miss expectations there. But the iPhone average selling price came in at a much stronger than expected $793. I had the chance to catch up with CEO Tim Cook. He told me that uh, it was a huge quarter for them on the high end of the line. Remember, their new 10s and 10s Max did become officially available in late September. As for guidance, though, 89 to 93 billion. The midpoint there is below expectations, though Cook uh, reminding investors there are some reality he's dealing with, including foreign exchange headwinds. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton, Cupertino, California. So let's turn to Paul Meeks for more on Apple's earnings results and what it means for tech going forward. He is the lead portfolio manager for the Wireless Fund, and he owns Apple's shares. Paul, welcome. Nice to have you here. Always a pleasure. Your, your reaction to the report, the street seems disappointed in after-hours trading. I'm modestly disappointed. The thing to know about sales is it's a multiplication of two items, right? You have units and you have average selling price. And the problem is the unit growth will continue to slow. Remember, at least in the developed world, we have market saturation of smartphones. So all the growth is going to come from the emerging markets. The problem with the emerging markets is, A, we have some issues with the key country, China, and B, there's a lot of folks in the emerging markets that can't spend $1,000 on a phone. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I worry about, Sue, is unless we can continue to increase these average selling prices, if we have flat, uh, flat units for iPhones, you're really going to cap the growth of Apple overall. But the thing I keep hearing, Paul, from bulls on Apple is that they look at the services that uh, Apple is continuing to supply, that it's becoming more and more of a services company, not just a hardware company. Does that not offset the, the, the slower growth in unit sales for iPhones? It partially offsets it. But uh, one of the things that I have a problem with, with the services business within Apple, when you take a look at Apple Pay and the other segments that are continued services. This is not proprietary content. It's essentially toll keeper revenue. And over time, I'd like to see Apple have more proprietary content, a la Netflix, a la the films that you see on uh, Prime Video for right. Amazon 
and some of the other players. So uh, what do you do with the stock at this point if you're a long-term trader? And what does it mean for, for the broader technology sector? What I would do with the stock is simply hold it. I would not be tempted when it drops probably 4 or 5% off the bat when we start trading tomorrow morning. I think an interesting price to maybe get in it, if you haven't done already or add to it, is about 190 And we're going to probably open tomorrow at about 210 215 so not there yet. I do think that this might put a bit of a pull mm -hmm. over the tech sector, which has already had a very rotten Indeed. October. The NASDAQ had its worst month in October since November of 2008. All right, Paul, thank you so much. Paul Meeks with the Wireless Fund. Thank you, guys. Well, one of the Dow components that helped lift the industrial average today was Dow DuPont. That company topped Wall Street estimates on stronger demand for chemicals used in cosmetics and paint, and that helped offset slowing growth in its agriculture business. The world's largest chemical maker also announced plans to spend $3 billion buying back its own shares over the next year, and those shares rose by 8 percent, making it the best performer in the uh, Dow today. Before the president's tweet this morning, the head of BlackRock said things between the U.S. and China could get worse before they get better. He made the comments while speaking at the New York Times Deal Book Conference. Well, I was in China a few weeks ago, and I do believe we are going to go. If, if the path remains the same in the next few weeks, we're going to have a full-fledged trade war. Fink, as you may know, is the head of the world's largest asset manager and one of the most influential figures in global finance. And with economic growth in China slowing, it appears that consumers in that country are saving more and spending less. But that may not necessarily be that good. Yunus Yun is in Beijing for us tonight. Beijing has been hoping that during this trade fight, the Chinese consumer could help hold up the economy. Well, there are indications that all this bad economic news and the trade war is weighing on people's minds here and scaring more of them into saving rather than spending. Consumers are pulling back and delaying purchases of big ticket items like cars. Sales in September dropped 11.6 percent from a year ago. Smartphone sales have been weakening all year, with third quarter China shipments down 10 percent from a year ago. We spoke to one worried consumer, a corporate lawyer, and he told us he's cut his monthly spending by a quarter. First of all, I'm cutting back because of the uncertainty in the Chinese economy. For example, China's local governments are suffering from high debt. The fragile financial system is also becoming a risk. Secondly, because the stock market and funds are facing greater pressure, my investments have shrunk quite a lot. And it doesn't bode well for foreign brands, which tend to price higher in this market across industries. If the consumption downgrade, as it's being called here, holds, there could be two potential outcomes. Policymakers here could have a bigger headache on their hands as they try to manage and meet their economic growth targets. And this could be another potential headwind for U.S. markets. Investors are already worried about a China slowdown. So if there's a widespread retrenchment of consumption, that could hurt U.S. companies. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Beijing. And from the Chinese economy to the U.S., where demand for new vehicles remained strong last month despite higher interest rates on auto loans. And as Phil LeBeau reports, drivers are also willing to shell out more money for those vehicles. From SUVs to pickup trucks, bigger and pricier vehicles remain the hot sellers in showrooms. Take the new Jeep Cherokee. After another big month in October, sales of the redesigned SUV are up almost 50 percent this year. Jeep and Ram trucks helped Fiat Chrysler do much better than expected in October, with sales growth easily outpacing Toyota and Ford. Overall, dealers saw brisk business last month, especially for models with higher sticker prices. At Ford, demand for new SUVs helped push up the price paid for a new vehicle by more than $1,400. Thanks to a strong economy, low unemployment, and high consumer confidence, people are willing to pay more for new cars and trucks. So far, higher rates and higher monthly auto loan payments are not scaring off buyers. Last month, the average auto loan had an interest rate of 6.2 percent, the highest auto loan interest rate since 2009. 
While those higher rates may not be stopping people from taking out a loan for a new vehicle, dealers admit it's getting tougher to close a sale, especially as automakers cut back on the number of 0% or low interest loans. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. A key economic number rose in the third quarter. That would be worker productivity, which was up by 2.2 percent. And that follows a strong gain in the spring as well, making this the best back-to-back -back performance in four years. Productivity is the amount of output per hour of work, and it has been weak throughout much of the current economic recovery. Worker productivity plays a key role in the economy and specifically in the president's goal of getting growth to 3 percent. Steve Leisman explains. Wanted, one million workers. That's the number of extra workers the U.S. economy will likely need if it's even going to have a chance to grow at 3 percent. That's a percentage point above what economists think right now as U.S. economic potential. Here's the math. Right now, U.S. economic potential growth is thought to be 1.9 percent. Half a point of that comes from workforce growth, and 1.4 percent comes from productivity. That is, American workers getting more efficient every year. But President Trump and others want to see growth return to the post-war average of 3 percent plus. To do that, the U.S. would need more workers and more productivity. Historically, any society or economy that has an aging population, has a shrinking labor force, um, it doesn't have to be the end of the world in terms of output and growth and your position in the world, but you have to run faster just to maintain the level of output that we currently have, which is around $20 trillion. To maintain that or even move it to $25 trillion, like you said, we're going to need a combination of more workers, automation, and reaching across our borders for more workers as well. Exactly how many more workers? Say half of the extra one percentage point of growth comes from growing the workforce. Right now, the U.S. is expected to add one million workers a year. Economists say another one million workers above and beyond what's forecast will be needed every year to add a half a point to potential growth. And that's even if the U.S. gets people who aren't working to start participating in the labor force. Conrad DeQuadros of RDQ Economics says it's really difficult to get this additional labor via higher participation rates because of the aging of the population. The U.S. could put more of the unemployed back to work, but the low 3.7 percent unemployment rate suggests the pool of workers is small and getting smaller. And the question is how much further the Federal Reserve will let unemployment fall before it feels it has to slam the brakes on the economy. I think they're on the edge. Their forecast would tell you they don't want it to go below three and a half. They just they I think they keep going gradually. I don't think it means that they have to go faster. It may ultimately mean they go further. Bottom line, it's going to be very hard for the U.S. to reach a goal of 3 percent growth. Not because there isn't work to be done. It's because there may not be enough workers. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Tomorrow, the monthly employment report is released, and expectations are for non-farm payrolls to increase 188,000. The unemployment rate is projected to remain steady at 3.7 percent, and average hourly earnings are poised to rise a fraction. Time to take a look now at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. We begin with Pfizer tonight. Their shares were cut to market perform from outperform at BMO Capital. The analysts cited a number of headwinds, including disappointing sales of some of the company's drugs. Price target now $46. Shares rose 1% today to $43.67. Chesapeake was upgraded to outperform from underperform at Raymond James. The analyst uh, calls Chesapeake's recent acquisition of Wild Horse transformative. The price target is $5. That stock rose more than 1.5% today to $3.57. And American Eagle Outfitters was downgraded to underperform from neutral at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. The analyst cited a lack of margin improvement there. Price target $18. That stock dropped 4.5% today to $22.02. Still ahead, you might be surprised by what investors did with their money during last month's rocky performance.
despite October's losses, investors took out only a modest amount of money out of the market last month. According to FactSet, U.S. equity ETFs saw outflows of a little more than just $3 billion. That's just 0.2 percent of assets under management. Equity funds that are considered buy and hold investments, like ETFs that track the S&P 500, saw large inflows. And that suggests that many were buying while stocks were declining. Speaking of which, let's turn to J.J. Kinahan to find out if his customers were buying or selling in the stock market last month. J.J., of course, chief strategist at TD Ameritrade. Welcome back. Hey, Bill. Always great to be on with nice you. Nice to see you again. I, I always love your monthly visits where you talk about what your customers were buying or selling, but especially after the month we had in October with all that tremendous volatility. And net-net, a lot of your customers were still buying technology, weren't they? They were. You know, we're not coming out with our monthly till uh, next week. But what we saw over the last, I think, week and a half is really interesting, Bill, because you see, you know, Microsoft, Amazon leading the way. And one of the stocks that was really interesting to me is one that's a little bit of a technology play, but also a yield play, and that would be AT&T. As, you know, I think sometimes people forget there's not only been volatility in stocks, there's been volatility in yield. So mm -hmm. many of your viewers who already probably own AT&T, see the big dividend, see the blue chip stock, get some exposure to technology, so it becomes a very interesting longer-term play for people. All right, let's flip it around. What were they selling? So uh, Twitter, which is a technology play, but rallied back, and, and as you guys know, reporting on it all the time, uh, has had some volatility itself over the last couple of years. But particularly in the last few months, it's had a nice run, and I think, you know, you saw some profit taking there. And the one that was really interesting that caught my eye was Ford, which mm -hmm. Ford tends to be a stock that many of our clients buy. But in these volatile times over the last week, uh, I think that people took their little bump over, you know, the last week or so to actually unload some of that position. That's probably, of all the stocks I just talked about, that one was the most surprising to me. Uh, among the buyers, back to the, the ones that they were buying uh, late in the month here, uh, Caterpillar is one that is considered one of the most vulnerable U.S. companies to the trade problems with China. But yet your customers were in there buying, weren't they? Yeah, they were, Bill. And, you know, if you look at what the stock's done over the last week and a half or so, it's up 10 percent. And so I think that that's a buy where people say, as you, they are very vulnerable to what's going on. But I think that many people look at that and say, longer term, still a good company. Maybe so much of this news is built in because from the very time that some of these tariffs were announced, Caterpillar, along with uh, Boeing and John Deere, were the very first stocks to take the brunt of this. And so any signs of hope there, and they seem to be the first ones to react to the upside also. Always very interesting. J.J., thanks for taking the time. Appreciate you stopping. Always a pleasure. J.J. Cranahan with TD Ameritrade joining us tonight. The New York Times tops 4 million in total subscribers, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Nearly two-thirds of its revenue came from subscriptions. Total revenue and profits were better than expected, and the CEO says strength in its digital ads helped as well. We've got a model which is delivering strong uh, uh, digital subscription growth, but also actually very encouraging digital advertising growth. Our digital advertising, as your chart showed, grew 17% year over year in the quarter. So what we hope is we've got a sustainable model for rapidly growing out a digital uh, uh, business out of journalism, which is growing much quicker than our print business is declining. The stock rose nearly 7% to 28.23. Teva Pharmaceuticals raised its 2018 earnings outlook, citing a stabilization in its core generics business. The company also said its turnaround plan is progressing, and it paired its debt, and it's been cutting costs. And investors sent the shares higher by 15 percent to $23 even. Health insurer Cigna bumped up its profit forecast for the year after topping earnings and revenue estimates for the most recent quarter. The CEO says the company was helped by lower medical costs, and he sees further improvement once its deal with Express Scripts is closed. The regulatory environment continues to press for more opportunity to improve affordability, and that's directly aligned with what Core Signet is doing and Core Express is doing, and it's the number one reason why we're putting the two companies together to further accelerate or improve affordability. But it's off a strong base that each company is delivering, and we think there'll be continued partnership opportunities from a regulatory standpoint to identify ways to improve affordability for individuals. 
Cigna shares rose 1% to 216.28. Spotify reported its first ever profit. However, the world's biggest paid music streaming service disappointed Wall Street with only modest subscriber growth. It was up only 2 percent when 8 to 9 percent was expected. And that sent shares lower by more than 5 percent today to 141.16. Then after the bell, CBS said that an increase in ad sales helped overall earnings top expectations. At that media company, they were also helped by growth in its digital subscription business. CBS shares were initially higher in after hours tonight. They finished the regular day up 2 percent to 58.49. Also on After the Bell tonight, Starbucks said that its strength in its domestic and Chinese markets led to same store sales that grew at a faster than expected pace. And that momentum also translated to profits that beat Wall Street estimates. Shares were initially higher in the after hours session. They ended the regular day up a fraction to 58.63. And coming up, Affordable Care Action open enrollment begins today, and there are some key changes to be mindful of. Google workers around the world staged walkouts in the last 24 hours to protest the company's handling of sexual misconduct issues. The demonstrations occurred at more than 20 locations globally, including its headquarters in Mountain View, California, offices in New York, as well as in London and Dublin and parts of Asia. The protesters are demanding more transparency around its handling of harassment issues and more worker empowerment. Every person who shows up to work at Google is an equal member of our community and deserves to be respected, protected and safe at work. I want Google to enforce the provisions that they already have and to uh, take seriously claims of people who are harassed. A lot of us are trying to step away from being passive allies and start act actively doing things to try to make a difference. We have the eyes of many companies looking at us and we've always been a vanguard company. So if we don't lead the way, nobody else will. Well, Google's CEO spoke today at the New York Times DealBook conference, and he said he actually supports these walkouts. Moments like this show that we didn't always get it right, and so we are committed to doing better. We are listening to employees. That's, uh, that's partly why today is important. And, you know, and I think there are concrete steps coming out uh, in terms of what we could do better. He added that this clearly has been a difficult time throughout the company. Good news for folks saving for retirement. Beginning in 2019, the IRS says the annual contribution limit for employees who participate in 401k plans will increase to $19,000. That's up from $18,500. That limit will also apply to 403Bs and thrift savings and most 457 plans. And the limit on the contributions to IRA accounts will increase from $5,500 to $6,000. Well, open enrollment is officially underway for the roughly 11 million Americans who buy health insurance through the federal marketplace. And if you're one of those consumers looking at the options, pay close attention to the details as some things like price may have changed from a year ago. Bertha Coombs reports. I work with a lot of seniors. When Nancy Sobin started her financial services firm three years ago, she qualified for a subsidized Affordable Care Act plan. That changed the last year. I didn't get the subsidy anymore because my business went well. Healthcare.gov prices are down one and a half percent on average for 2019, but Nancy finds her plan in New Jersey is going up. My same plan looks like it's going to be about $150 more per month. She might save if she switches plans. After years of uncertainty, which led to price hikes, insurers are starting to turn a profit on the exchanges. And for 2019, carriers like six-year-old startup Oscar Health are offering more options and expanding coverage. We increasingly are in a market that has found stability. Uh, and so uh, this is a special open enrollment period for us. 
we feel great about going into more markets. Another big change, the Trump administration extended the length of cheaper short-term plans that have fewer benefits but will cover up to 12 months. Online brokerage eHealth boosted its staffing this fall to help consumers not eligible for subsidies explore their alternatives. United Healthcare is coming with some really innovative products for the individual short-term uh, market. So there's just a lot more choice. Now the negative to that is there's more complexity. And as this is a complicated and a consequential decision for families, it's just more important than ever that they shop. And do your homework, says Nancy, after considering a short-term plan which claimed her doctors were in network. I called my doctors and they, uh, they said they don't take those plans. It would have been a good savings, but I don't really trust that it would have covered anything. Next year, Americans also won't have to pay a penalty for being uninsured, but insurers are confident people will still sign up. Members in this market have, have started to become educated to the point where they realize it isn't just about premium, it's about the service you get. Election polls show health care affordability remains a top issue for most Americans. EHEL Scott Flanders says if the House and Senate leadership are split after the midterms, that will likely lower the odds of big legislative changes, and that could provide more stability for the exchange markets through 2020. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bertha Coombs. And that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.